Love it every time. Makes me happy. And happy to be with you folks here today at Desmos Live. 30 minutes of fun math, fun tech, fun students all the way around. Uh, let them know who you are in the chat, where you're from, where you're, where you're calling in from, watching from. Um, the great land of Discordia. I don't know. Uh, got someone from the UK emailed saying that they're watching right now. It's awesome. Happy to have you folks here. And especially happy uh, to have my colleagues, a couple of first timers to Desmos Live. So let them know how you feel about that in the chat. Uh, we got here Lisa Beirano and Michelle Wynn. Uh, Lisa's out from, uh, where, where are you from, Lisa? Tell me uh, where you're from and what your deal is at Desmos. I'm in Colorado and I've been at Desmos for two and a half years and my deal is that I write lessons. Right on, and that's why you're here today. Michelle, say what's up and uh, where you're from and what your deal is. Uh, I'm Michelle, I am from Northern California and I've been at Desmos for about two years, copy editing. Nice. Um, we're so happy to have them on for a segment later. We're calling Secrets of the Activity Team Revealed. It's going to be a blast. Before that, though, I uh, got some show and tell from last week. Last week, if you'll recall, um, Jay Chow shared with you folks how to create um, some dynamic text in notes in Desmos. And you folks just showed up and did some really fun stuff with that. I was really impressed. Uh, Katie Bookbinder had a, a neat move here where she's got... Um, this triangle and it's uh, giving the uh, the side lengths of that triangle dynamically in the notes so people can figure out, do I have a, a, a side, side, side congruency? Love seeing that move. We got other folks here. Mr. Maestri here is um, doing a, uh, not just a dynamic text, but also having a kind of a, some friction in there with that check your answer so you don't like just see it right away. Um, love that, really cool. I uh, got that some slick like X minus, and then if it goes negative, it changes to positive like it should. That's cool, not sure how that happened. That's awesome, love it. A couple more here. Um, Richard Hung, Desmos Fellow, did something neat here with circle feedback, took um, Jay's uh, example and inserted that button right there. Did some neat stuff, what's gonna happen? There's a green point there at the origin. I'm curious what that's gonna do. I don't know about you, Lisa, Michelle, my first move is always just to do something wrong, incorrect, and see what it tries to, how it tries to make sense of what I'm up to. So that's look right there. Take what's going on there. Really cool stuff. A couple more here. Um, this right here is from Bob Lachelle who told us he was gonna do it. Bob, if you're in the chat, let him know what you're up to with this right here. So we got this uh, this light blue circle here, sky blue. And if I move this around and I'm, and I'm incorrect with it, check my work, it turns to orange. And if I go over here, it turns to red. And I'm really curious of what I'm supposed to understand from these colors here. I love them, very pretty. Ooh, neon green. Okay, what's happening here? Anyway, Bob's up to some shenanigans right there. And then a couple more, a couple more. Um, Kurt Salisbury, uh, what are you doing here, Kurt? This is so wild. So you draw this right here and I can zoom in. Okay, Kurt's always playing with these like the starry night background from I guess Among, uh, Among Us or some game that kids like, I don't know what. Uh, is it Among Us, is that what it is? Everybody's about right now? Lisa, Michelle, back me up here. Michelle, no help. Lisa, no help. We're all no help to you on the video game scene. Anyway, not quite right, uh, but if I do it if I do it correctly, hold on, hold on. Uh, negative six, let's see that's right here, and then positive eight, is this right, right here? And then 36, so that would be one, two, three. Check this out, what happens? Do I have it? Give me those 60 points. And you gotta plan it and spot on? That's bonkers, cool stuff. Um, moving on here. I love this. I want. I saw this on Twitter because I'm always watching the Desmos Twitter account, and I I wanted to print this out. I wanted to screen print it onto a blanket. I wanted to wrap myself in that blanket. This tweet made me so happy and uh, feel warm inside. Right here, uh, Stacy here is asking, what's the best way to give feedback uh, about this question right here? Finding the coordinates of the mid segment triangle right there. And what's cool is that Stacy like has been around, and Stacy knows there's an obvious way to give feedback here. One could just tell a student when they type in coordinates you're right or you're wrong. And there's not no value there, but I just love seeing Stacy push herself to imagine other kinds of feedback that might attach more meaning to student thinking of that. Like what if the student like gets all of them correct except for like one coordinate is incorrect. Um, and we're gonna tell that student they're wrong, just like we tell a student who typed in random numbers that they're wrong. Now that first student has like a lot of meaning we can attach to it if we're creative. So Lisa, Lesson developer, uh, you see this, what's on your mind? What kind of feedback would be helpful here? Uh, well, my first thought is if there's a way we can give feedback where students will get an idea of how to improve their work as a response, as a result of the feedback that they get. So maybe we just show them what they did. So it 
connecting the representations. If they enter the coordinates of the mid segments, we can graph those coordinates. Just show them what they did. Just reflect what they did um, in, a, in, in the world in which they're doing it and let them do it again, try again. Um, I dig it, just want to share really fast, um, as fast as I can, not being a lesson developer anymore, uh, pro stuff from Lisa. I'm gonna try this out right here and see if I, I know how to do this. So um, uh, let me just see here, here's an empty activity. S stop me if I, if, I, if I blow this here. Um, mid segment coordinates, okay. Uh, note, what are the mid segment coordinates? How about that, Man, coordinates, so far so good. Um, I'm gonna do a graph right here. You get those points in front of you, Lisa, by chance? Yeah, nah? I got him. Sure. Uh, so, so we got <laughs> three, nine, uh, seven, five, and one, one. Okay, this is just how I might do this right here. I'm gonna type in uh, polygon X1, Y1, and that creates that polygon, slick. And I'm gonna long press on this right here. Messed it up the, fir the first time as I always do. And not fill it. Okay, okay, okay. Um, Stacy's got like the point labels there. I do not, but that's not as necessary for this uh, this moment right here. So how to get students to like type in coordinates somewhere, nothing to type into here. Maybe we do a table. I promised Stacy I'd share how one person might do this. And I'm gonna ask you folks to do this better in a second. Um, so here's X and Y, and then here's three uh, coordinates here. It's possible to do this, um, I think with just like one cell each maybe, and use and like kind of parse out what the coordinate is, but that's a bit beyond what I feel like doing right now. Um, so if I, I wanna be able to type in like one, one, two, five, seven, one or something, and I wanna, to Lisa's point, see that triangle form right there. Uh, but there's no connection. There's no connection from that table to that graph yet. We gotta connect it using computation layer. So I'm gonna go into this graph right here and set up the guts of it first and create a new table. This table's gonna have some variables in it that I'm gonna fill dynamically with computation layer. I'm just picking like A1, uh, oh, whoa, whoa, uh, A2 and A3 out of the hat, and then B1, B2, B3. Gosh, I'm nervous to know how, um, how Lisa would do this differently at the moment. I'll do polygon X2, Y2, and nothing's gonna happen right there. It will not happen right now because it doesn't know what A1 and B through B3 are, uh, but we can fix that. So now we head over here, done. We gotta give this table a name, uh, Dan's table. Okay, and then we're gonna go into the computation layer of the graph right here and go say, hey, uh, Dan's table, give me those numbers. What numbers you got, give them to me. And we're gonna file those under A1 through A3 and B1 through B3, and we'll see what happens. So to assign numbers to variables, number A1, like this right here. I could put like the number five right here, and five would drop into that variable. Uh, we want it to be dynamic though. So we're gonna, go to, gonna grab Dan's table, now, now we're going and looking in the table. And we wanna say something like, um, give me uh, the, the cell that's um, you know one row deep, one uh, column deep, I think is kind of what we want here. And so to do that in, in terms that Desmos understands, uh, we see what we have on offer here, um, cell numeric value, let's do that, that looks good. And then this hey, takes- Dan, can you zoom in? Oh yeah, can you zoom I think in? so. Yes. Whoa, small screen. Yeah, thank you for that. And the crowd thanks you too. Okay, uh, so it's one, one, I think. I think that works. Maybe. And then A2 is one more row deep. So there we go. And then A3, three rows deep. And I'll do the same thing for B. All the Bs as well. But this isn't right. What's missing here? Um, bah, 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 bah. This is the B's are in the other column, in the second column. I think this is it. If I press preview here, zoom back out a little bit, and I type in, um, so that'd be at two, five is one maybe, um, five, seven, five, eight, and then, and this is, yeah, this is, pro this is nice, but I think people are gonna make this a lot nicer. So I don't know, this right here, like this is wrong, but it's not like super wrong. It's like, it's it's one number wrong. And there should, I, I think that our feedback ought to, to students ought to differentiate, ought to like um, do justice to the, the thinking that the student did here. Um, and I can say like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I, I got that wrong there. So I don't know, that's one move there. 
I would love to see, I'll put this activity in the show notes. I would love to see, same as what you folks did with the previous uh, uh, Jay's activity with the circle. What? How would you improve this? How would you make this uh, different, better, change it? I didn't love that like uh, I could see the triangle changing as I was going because then I'm like distracted and dazzled by the feedback. I'm not thinking mathematically. I'm thinking like, what's the computer telling me here? Lisa, what are some uh, what are some ways that they can tune uh, this up? Like other kinds of like fun challenges we could offer them. Like or, or Michelle, like when you if you saw this in review, what suggestions might you pass back to the original author on this? I would definitely add a button so that the triangle doesn't show up till the button is pressed. Another thing that yeah. comes to mind is that it'd be nice. Go oh, go ahead, Michelle. I just update the colors. I miss you there, Michelle. What was that? I'd update the colors. Update the colors? What color should we be yeah. using here? <laughs> um, I'd like to see a nice blue uh, and then maybe a green. A nice blue and green. And tell, tell them that that's like not just your favorite colors or your school colors or something like that. Like wh why, why those colors? Uh, they're complementary. At least I think so. Nice. Uh, and we'll get into more of how that attention, how we pay attention to those details uh, shortly. So uh, this right here, that's that's for uh, Stacy. We wanted to, I, I mentioned that we would be uh, chatting about this today on Desmos Live. Stacy, if you're on the chat, let us know what you think about that, what you might do next, uh, what questions you have. I'll toss that in the show notes so you can play around with that yourself. Just uh, again, I love the thoughtfulness here. It's just, it, it's it's great that we can tell students that they're right or wrong versus telling them nothing. But I just love how Stacy's pushing herself as we often do at Desmos. Like, what is the way that we can do justice to the brilliance that students offer us every single day all across the world? They, they're just throwing their brilliance in these activities. How can we send something back that honors that and helps them develop that? So nice stuff there. What we're about to do right now is uh, drop some secrets on you folks. We at Desmos, our, our activity creation process, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to share what it was when I first arrived at Desmos compared to what it is now, but it's gone from just me and the team of designers and engineers at Desmos making one activity, Penny Circle it was called, over the span of about eight months while I was in grad school on a side project, to uh, maybe four people, which included Lisa, all of us kind of making our own thing that we wanted to make and like sending it around for some feedback, but nothing even close to as systematic as developed a process as it is right now. It's so exciting. We have this curriculum that we're building out uh, and piloting and programming and, and offering to teachers uh, this year and the next and ongoing. Um, and the feedback has been amazing. Uh, this this ranking called an, uh, an MPS, whatever. It's a, We've been comparing it all across uh, the market. It's just people are really enjoying it. And what I love about it is that's not by accident. There is a, a very uh, detailed, rigorous process that goes into creating activities that, that students love. It involves dozens of people across our company from you know, every level, uh, different teams creating graphs. Um, and we have here people who are lesson developers and uh, Michelle who's, uh, who does quality assurance on the activities to make sure that every last T is dotted and I is crossed. And that's why I'm not a copy editor, Michelle. So I'm just excited to learn uh, from them what they've been up to. They both have some uh, some stuff to share with you about how um, we, we come up with activities here, how we develop them and how um, how you, though you only have, I don't know, we, we don't want you to feel like you got to spend these, this many hours on activities, but we'll offer some insights you might be able to take into your own lesson creation as well. And if you do work for a competing curriculum company, I, I love you, we love you, but please get off the, the stream right now. This is top secret stuff. Okay, so enough wind up here. Um, I'm gonna check the comments and see what questions you folks have are asking. Lisa, this is over to you. Tell them how it is at Desmos activity team. All right, here's the, uh, the secrets. Um, we usually start with scouting. And when we scout, we make a big document that looks at an entire unit, and then we kind of just write a quick summary of what's gonna happen in each lesson um, once we figure out roughly where the lessons will fall. And so I took a little screenshot. This is from July 29th of our scouting document for lesson 16 in one of our units. Um, we have very detailed learning goals there. <laughs> this, is definitely a lesson that's going to be about solving inequalities and maybe it should include graphing and i also noticed this uh, extra suggestion that says they should see some graphs so i think we want them to see graphs of inequalities is what we're starting with so then after that we uh 
start thinking about, well, what was what's going to be in this lesson? What's it going to look like? So I often make a cool down to start to figure out where I'm going. And so if I start with that, then I can build a lesson that gets there. So this was the cool down we agreed on. So they're going to graph the solutions to an inequality, which achieves the uh, planned learning goals. And so next is to figure out a, a core interaction. Like, what's the thing that students are going to be doing in this lesson to uh, engage in it? So we start brainstorming. We have a Google Doc, and uh, we just start feverishly writing bad ideas. Um, here's a few. I just took some screenshots. This is uh, the end of August now. So this is an idea about a bridge overpass, and maybe they like solve inequalities to decide like what boats can go through, but then there's going to be a water level that's rising. And we were like, this, maybe that's a bit much. So uh, there was also an idea about a heist. I remember there was talk of a heist um, and making inequalities that dictate what we can or cannot do something. I didn't understand that idea. Um, we tossed it pretty quick. This was September 8th. We had a couple more, more uh, brainstorming. We looked back at other lessons because we couldn't come up with an interaction that felt right. So we're like, well, could we use turtles? That's always a question we have to ask ourselves is, <laughs> do turtles fit here? Um, <laughs> and we also thought about something with sales tax, but that felt very pseudo context. Um, so one thing I do and the other developers do when we're struggling is look at the database of all of the images we, that Desmos has ever made, which is pretty wild. It's uh, just a wild array of images. And we just scroll through and think about what what could happen here. Is there like something visual, that some feedback we could use? Is there some way to connect students solving inequalities with a visual? And so through that process, we found sheep. And we know that uh, we have a strong theory that if there's wiggly legs, there is delight. Like those go together. So anytime we can add wiggly legs. Yep. Right I'm there. Wiggly legs are key for delight. Uh, top secret there. I hope you people are <laughs> writing this down. Like if you're not writing this down, I'm not sure what we're, what we're even doing here. Wiggly right, lines yeah. equals delight. Wiggly legs, yes. So uh, this is the first, first draft of Shira the Sheep. She came down in a parachute because we happened to have an image of a parachute and uh, she ate stars. <laughs> we thought it was promising. We're as, like, All right. as sheep do, as sheep do. <laughs> right, <laughs> seems logical. Um, well, there were images what we had in our database. <laughs> so then we thought, all right, we have a core interaction. How can we turn this into a lesson? What, how is this going to work? And so then we send that interaction around to the team. And in the same Google Doc, we get some feedback. So this is now mid-September. Um, and this is feedback we got from some folks who saw our idea. I like that it says makes for a fun game, but sad if it was the entire thing. Like, it wasn't great. Um, they suggested blades of grass instead of stars. I'm not sure why. Stars are pretty great to eat. Um, and lots of ideas there around using grass uh, and maybe some other things that we put in there. So then we took that and went back and worked on it. And we have this cute little ledge now um, to how to, to address the strict inequality versus not strict inequality. And I can show you what that version looked like. It's kind of great. Um, so if I put in the wrong solution here, so if x is less than or equal to 3, we can watch Shira come down. Oh, and there's an airplane. And she's dropped down, and the ledge breaks. And we get this message. She didn't like it. Um, so there was a couple things wrong with this. It was a, it was a good start. We were getting closer. Um, part of the problem here was the airplane. Some folks were concerned that it wasn't nice to the sheep. <laughs> we should be a little nicer to the sheep. So we had a uh, last minute emergency where we had to quickly figure out because we were trying to get this lesson done as quick as we could and uh, we need to get rid of the airplane. Before we got rid of the airplane, this was a feedback we got on it. This is just to show you the level of feedback and the way folks look at this. And I actually played that animation many times, zooming in, trying to see this happen. But there was a feedback we got that uh, the sheep was appearing slightly before she dropped. Um, and I thought that that was just funny. <laughs> I just enjoyed it. <laughs> that, and that's, that's where were... kind of like we have people who are so detail oriented across our company and so many of them. And I don't know the, the aggregate, the sum of all of those like notice scenes like that. I think it really does add up to something special, something delightful. It's uh, but however small it might seem in the moment. That's really cool. Well, and on that um, fact, this was another piece of feedback we got was I love the gravel, but I really want to just crumble a little bit. Like this is, and the clouds should move a little. <laughs> and so there's a lot of a lot of back and forth in detail. And this was so weird for me to get used to, as because I was a teacher for a long time and made lessons in you know 20 to 40 minutes, whatever time I could to squeeze it in. And now all of a sudden I'm spending. I mean, here this is September 25th, so this is like three months later, trying to get this crumble right. 
um, it's a whole different thing, but it ended up with a delightful lesson where Shira comes down on a lovely cloud, um, which you may have seen before. And that was October 23rd that we released this, uh, that that tweet came out. Oh, I already had an ad in And so now we have the nice cloud and the little crumble. And of course we built a whole lesson, not just one screen, <laughs> but that was the, uh, the journey. After that, the lesson goes through our copy editing process and there's also a tune-up process and Michelle is going to tell you about that. Love that. Let me just um, bring up a couple of questions here coming through the, the chat. One might be more appropriate for graph team, um, but we'll see. Uh, coming from our, uh, our friends at the Discord server. Again, don't know what Discord is. Not going to find it today. Maybe tomorrow. Uh, they're asking, um, does the activity team use simulations? What about cl clickable objects? Or rather, it's kind of like a, a question wrapped, a statement wrapped as a question. I can tell this, um, but like, wh why not just use simulations versus sliders? Lisa, do you have an opinion there as a developer, or is that uh, is this is this a a Suzanne is this a bring Suzanne on also kind of question here as well? Tell me about it. This is a Suzanne question, but I do know that they're using simula simulations for the clouds. I think it was the first time we used simulations in an activity. That's no joke. All right, that's that's a, some fun history right there. Some fun inside baseball there, uh, Mad Lab. So hope you're into that. Other one comes from Scott Miller here asking about like what part of the lesson development process is hardest to push through. Do you have an opinion about that? Gosh, there's lots of pain in lots of the parts. Um, it's really fun to brainstorm and collaborate, but when you just can't, like you feel like we used to, we call it mountain finding, and when we, we're trying to figure out the right core interaction, and often we'll say like it feels like we're circling the mountain, but we're not climbing it. Um, and when we, we do a lot of that, uh, it starts to get a little draining. But once we start making progress, it's kind of exciting. And uh, all the back and forth, once we've found the mountain, is really fun to watch it shape up. So I, I'd, I'd have to say the mountain finding process, the figuring out the core interaction. Yeah, I feel like the team has thrown away more good mountains than I ever created on my own as a teacher for lesson plans. Like you take take the, the recycling pile from the Desmos mountain finding process and there's like a, a zillion lessons I would be thrilled with as a, as a teacher on my own. Uh, we have this whole team able to bring lots of resources though. So I love that we hold such a high bar for those. Uh, Michael asks about s standards that, that lend themselves less easily to visualization. Uh, what, what's your take there, Lisa? I see the questions, how do we tackle those standards? I think it depends on, I think it's hard to answer that in general. Um, often we just decide the paper is more appropriate. Like sometimes students need to, you know, write down, solve an equation on paper. It's doing it on, or graphing uh, tape diagrams, drawing tape diagrams is another one that's just more fun on paper than it is on a, trying to squeeze it into a digital format. So yeah. Yeah, I so I mean, Kent, Kent's asking here. Kent's asking here about deciding between fully tech versus paper lessons. I think you've you've hinted to like there's some lessons where symbolic manipulation is a huge part of it, or shading, or scribbling, um, and those are ones where we'll choose paper. Oftentimes, those coincide with ones that are um, less easy to visualize with sheep or turtles, for instance. Basically, if the math leads to sheep or turtles, we visualize it, and if it does not, then we go to pen and paper, is how I, I think I'm understanding Lisa's process here, if I have that exactly right. Yeah, and we also do paper lessons. We try to squeeze in a few that are like just a, a poster day, where students synthesize everything they've learned and have a little bit more freedom, because paper has no structure, um, whereas this does most of the activities have a lot more structure to them. Right on, thanks Lisa. More questions, toss them in there. Um, jumping over to Michelle here, who um, takes our activities, not the final mile, but like the final several miles and um, just tunes them up to an unbelievable degree. And there's so much that goes into this. And I feel like it's the sort of thing where you don't know that it's been done. You would know if it wasn't done. And the fact that it's done so well across an entire curriculum just adds right up to a really nice feeling about things. So uh, Michelle's gonna share it with you how, to, how we polish the lessons up. Over to you, Michelle. Um, right. So. Uh at this stage, uh, the lesson developer uh, pushes the lesson into the polishing stage. Um, this isn't a stage that gets a lot of fanfare, but it's a crucial step in lesson development um, because this is where we make sure that our lessons work, that the experience is good, and that there aren't embarrassing mistakes lurking around the corner. Um, so there are two stages of polishing. There's tune-ups and then there's quality assurance. And our tune-ups process is broken into five parts or five focuses. And we have experts on our team that take up each of these focuses. And I'm gonna go through just some of these and give you examples of the kinds of things we fix up or tune up during the process. So um, in a CL tune-up, our CL wizards, Jay and John, 
Try to anticipate where students might break interactions and then put in safeguards to prevent students from breaking it. They also, they also ensure a consistent style across all screens. So um, an example is color. Um, so the sketch color on this screen is green. And then it's also green on this screen. And then we're hit with this atrocious orange. Uh, so Jay and John might go in to the CL here and change this to green. Let's go back and check. All right, now we have a lovely green and everything is right with the world. Uh, next up, we have the dashboard tune-up. Um, our lovely colleague, Zach, does this, he goes in and ensures that correct, correctness indicators and warnings show up as expected. And um, also that teacher screens are informative. Uh, what does informative look like? Not this. So this screen is asking students to solve an inequality to help share eat all the grass and to complete as many challenges as they'd like. And on the teacher side, all they're seeing is the name of their students and some thumbnails of clouds, not very helpful. So Zach did some magic and this is what the teacher sees now in our activity. Wow. Uh, they see how many challenges a student has completed along with their inputs, which is super helpful. Give it up, um, that's so cool. Yeah, and the way we were able to do that was by adding in an extra graph component so the top graph component here creates the student facing side and then the one at the bottom called dashboard only creates this lovely teacher screen that you see here. Um, moving along, we have student text. Um, so this is what I do. I read through all of the student prompts on our activity screens. Um, this is usually the stage where I see the lesson for the first time. So I'm coming in with a completely blank slate, no context whatsoever. I like to read through the entire activity at first just for content um, and I make note of any confusion that arises. And then I read through it again and again and again for grammar and to uh, rephrase awkward sentences. Um, an example of an awkward sentence might be something like this. This was the original sentence here select all of the pieces of information that tell you that the number of minutes a turtle has been moving X and the distance the turtle has traveled in meters Y is a proportional relationship. It's not wrong, um, but I think I have to read that about five times to really understand what it's asking me. A better way to say that is this, select all of the pieces of information that show a proportional relationship between X and Y. And the reason why this sentence is so much more effective is because the direct object closely follows the verb. Whereas here, they're kind of far apart and separated by all of this text here. So your brain kind of has to make the connection for itself. It takes a while. Uh, this sentence is just a lot easier to understand. You didn't think you were gonna um, learn about composition on the stream today. You gotta <laughs> expect the unexpected on Desmos Live. For real though, I love having Michelle edit my own writing. Uh, anything you see me write, even a, every tweet goes through Michelle, uh, for real. Uh, but she like always, it's just always teaching some just fantastic sensible tips for how to, how to write better. It's awesome. Keep going, sorry. All right, um, so now we're pretty much done with uh, tune-ups, but the lesson still needs to go through one last stage and that's QA. And we divide this into two parts. There's faculty QA where a lesson developer who isn't the author runs through the entire lesson as a student and makes sure that the lesson as a whole meets our high bar of quality and uh, delightfulness. And then they pass it to me. Um, I go through more or less the same process, um, but this stage also includes all of the copy editing that happens. Um, it's not just copy editing the lesson, but if you have access to our curriculum, it's also all of the wonderful content there, like our lesson guides, our lesson summaries, um, our learning goals, our vocabulary, all of that good stuff. And now I'm gonna segue into something that has nothing to do with copy editing, but it is an example of something that we might catch during QA. Screencast times, do it. <laughs> 
I think this is a fun screen. Um, let's see, drag the movable point to add gas to the car's tank. It's easy enough. All right, wait a second. What are those numbers? Uh, okay, it's obstructing my view of the odometer. I don't really know. I, they look like coordinates. Um, I don't think they make sense in this context. So I'm gonna go into the CL and add trace false and see if that makes the thing disappear. Let's try this again. Oh, great. I can see, I'm gonna go 4.5 gallons. Boom. And yeah, that's, that's the life of a lesson before it takes on a whole new life in the classroom. That's fantastic. I hope you folks have found, I know I'm seeing people in the, in the uh, chat talking about how they've seen ways to make their own dashboards uh, a little bit tuned up here. Scott's talking about how, yeah, this is the hardest part for him or teachers is to use a teacher screen and digest all that information. And Michael's saying like, oh, this is great. Like I couldn't find the thing I wanted on the overlay now go fix it. So I'm glad that folks are pulling something out of this that's helpful for them and their activity creation or their own lesson planning in other media, by all means, if you're a middle school teacher, middle school, a uh, person who has influence over curriculum purchasing decisions in middle school, grab that link in the chat right there, learn.desmos.com slash curriculum and tell them Desmos Live sent you, hit that apply button. We'd love to see you in the program. There's a couple questions I wanna tackle uh, real quick, maybe just four minutes here and um, then we'll say so long to everybody here. One of them is about titling lessons. Um, Kurt, who has an orange uh, icon there, Michelle, just try to like avert your eyes, I guess, I don't know. Um, but he's wondering about uh, naming the lessons. Some of them are awesome. I, some, some, Kurt, Kurt, some of them, some of them, Kurt. Who does the naming though? You haven't, neither of you have mentioned that part, part of this. I, uh, it's a combination of folks. Often the lesson developer comes up with one and then like maybe Sean's doing the graph for a lesson and he has a great idea and he'll just, change it in the middle of his graph editing. And next time I look at it, it's got a new name and it's great. And we just keep editing it when we have better ideas until we're happy with it as we pass it around. What's the prob bear abilities? I think I saw that one float around online for a second. Uh, who, who, dude, who, whom did that? I don't even that remember. Is, it was either Sean, Sean or I. It was either Sean or I. We were passing that one back and forth a bunch. Fair enough. Uh, talk to me about um, on the QA process, Michelle, do we test these activities? How do we test them uh, aside from one person like making a class code for themselves and, or clicking through in the preview? What's the testing process like? Great question from Tracy, I'm curious too. Oh yeah, that's a great question. We used to do student testing or user testing. Um, we stopped because, um, well, I'm just gonna read exactly what our designer says. Uh, we, we still user test new features and bigger UI changes to the website with teachers, but norm, no more lesson user testing. You could vaguely mention um, the interactions were clear already. So we don't do user testing anymore. There it is, nice. Um, and I'm just curious, uh, we have another question here. Uh, Kathy just wants to know like, what's uh, what's the, which lesson for you has been uh, you think about a rewarding lesson, lesson that makes your you know, heart sing a little bit. What's on your mind? I don't know. That's like asking me which of my children is the Choose favorite. You know, like a they, child. It's a lot of work. Some of them I like don't want to ever look at again. <laughs> but I'm also really proud that they're out in the world. <laughs> some, some children, I, I think, probably. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anything on your yeah, on your mind, pick. Michelle? Yeah. When you think about that question? Yeah. Same for me. I I can't choose. <laughs> Sorry, so I Kathy, to say fit we're, fights is close to my heart. Fit fights is a, is has a lot of what we I think we love about our work here. Um, whether the world loves it, who knows? But like I think it has a lot of what, what we love about doing work here at Desmos. Yeah. Um, Richard's asking about for teachers that don't have teams developing lessons, and I gotta say again, like this is stuff that we do with a huge team and tons of time, and we're not teaching, and bells aren't ringing, and we're not wearing masks, and you know, like that kind of thing is just not our world right now. We want to support you folks with this stuff. Don't feel obligation or judgment from us on this. Uh, but if you don't have a team, what's the best way to test your activities to make sure they don't break halfway through class? Michelle, what a, what a, like a common thing that seems like oh that would have broken halfway through class if I hadn't caught that. Um, usually it's uh, nonsensical inputs. So sometimes we have questions that ask uh, for an answer that might be like an inequality or a number or an equation. And like uh, the input would be something like X or N or Z. Um, and so we make sure that we put in error messages 
to uh, nudge students in the right direction. Um, but we don't want to say that it's outright wrong because it's not something that they calculated and um, and like got to the wrong place. It's just kind of a, you know a, a random input. Super helpful, super helpful. Yeah, again, that, that spirit of trying not to prejudge student thinking, to accept it, but to help them know when like they might have, we are not understanding each other in the same way on a question. Um, two last questions, one from Stacy, um, who we just saw a tweet from earlier. Welcome to the, the stream, Stacy. Um, do you ever go back, um, what, what is like the revision process like once new features are released? And let me see if I can find the other question was about timeline. What is the timeline uh, for making lessons? Might be kind of a similar uh, uh, theme here. So yeah, Lisa, can you speak to those questions? We usually plan on a unit at a time and we give ourselves around two months to do about 16 lessons. And there's a team of three developers that work on that. So we we don't have to do one lesson at a time. We do. We were always working on a bunch of them at once, but it's about two months to do about 16 lessons, maybe three months, depending on the time of year, if there's holidays and things. That'll do it, folks. Whoa, 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 not that, not that. We're not starting up again. Uh, let me just uh, jump back to my screen there. If uh, Really happy to, that Lisa and Michelle hopped on the stream with us here. First timers, just really uh, just blew the doors off with your first time appearance. Uh, pros with the, with the commenters, you knew just how to wrangle them, keep them all, uh, focused. Uh, they could, sometimes it kind of wander off track sometimes, but uh, it was a great conversation in the comments. Appreciate all your questions. Appreciate you folks giving feedback on our lessons and telling us what you need and don't like and like, and uh, that helps us build uh, to support you folks. If you folks want to get a curriculum uh, next year for middle school, grades six through eight, by all means, grab uh, that link, pass that around to your colleagues in middle school and um, tell them Desmos Live sent you. And if you have other kinds of questions you wanna uh, ask Lisa and Michelle, you got Lisa's Twitter handle right there. Uh, tweet her, Michelle is not available for questions uh, via Twitter anyway. Nice job there, Michelle. Stay focused, stay focused on the work. And uh, it's just always a treat to hang out with you folks every Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific. Till next time, folks, take care.